we could, let's turn to 1 Timothy 4. And we're going to read the first part of this verse. And um, we'll just see what the Lord does. Amen. 1 Timothy 4.10 says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas is mentioned in the Bible three times. Two times positively, and one time right here, kind of negatively. I, I want to speak to you for the next few minutes on this subject, distractions. Distractions. Amen? Let's lift our hands one more time and say, God bless, God anoint, and God speak to me. And we'll give you glory. And everybody said amen. You may be seated. What are things that distract? Mm. I have to be very careful about that. And you do too. You're human. But number one is your thoughts. Well, we, some of you are sitting here and you're listening to me and you're locked in. Others of you have a thought that may have pulled you away. Amen. Well, we all do that. Focusing on things that, we're trying to do more than one thing at a time. I, I can't do that. That's just not me. I, 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 get, I make me a list and it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I may skip one, but I'm going to go to the next one and finish it before I go back to that other one. Because I can only do one thing at a time. I know that if I switch my focus, I won't get any of it done. Feelings. Oh, my goodness. That can distract us. And attention. Tonight, when I speak about the presence of God, it's going to be a little bit different than last week. Because this week, I want to speak on the manifest presence of God. Everybody say, manifest presence of God. Well, there's a difference, yeah, amen. There were, I'll bring up five different situations where the manifest presence of God was given out. When the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the temple that Solomon built, and they brought in with singing and worshiping, there was a cloud gathered there, and it was so strong, and, and the presence of God was so strong, they couldn't minister because of the cloud. And then there was the dedication of the temple. When Solomon finished his prayer of dedication, fire came down, consumed the sacrifice, and the glory of the God filled the temple. Hallelujah. And the ministers could not minister we have had a manifest presence of God in this church before to where I, I, uh, the minister did not get to minister why because God came down hallelujah and his manifest presence filled the house where we were sitting and we gave glory to God and it was like hey I can't now do God <clears throat> when they started singing Waymaker I said Lord are you just going to preach my message tonight because you never know when God wants to take over. And when he wants to take over, we stand back. Hallelujah. Because his presence, his manifest presence can minister more than I could ever say. He just takes over. And then on the day of Pentecost, everybody say day of Pentecost. A mighty gust of wind filled the room, and fire came upon the people. And there was a manifest presence of God so strong that people were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost for the first time. Oh, what a presence of God. And we still enjoy that presence of God right here, right now. In Acts 4, the disciples were praying, and the Bible says the place was shaken. With the power of God. And then tonight I want to speak to you about Elijah. And the manifest presence that is very unique in his life. If we go to 1 Kings 19 and 9. 
We're going to start reading at that ninth verse, and we're going to see what God will speak to us. Bible says, and he, which is Elijah, came thither into a cave, and he lodged there. And behold, the word of God came to him and said unto him, What doest there, Elijah? And when God asks a question, he needs to get an answer. And this is Elijah's answer. And he said, I have been very jealous. You could you put the word zealous there. It's the same exact meaning if you look in the Strong's Concordia. For the Lord God of hosts and for the, children of, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, am the only one left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go forth. God said, go forth and stand in the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. Oh, have you ever felt the presence of God when it just passed by? Amen. And a strong wind. Strong wind. The Bible said it was so strong it rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. We know around here what strong winds are. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. A still, small voice. You know, we love the big times when we come to the house of God. I do. That's why I, I come here for that. I come here to worship God. And I'll be careful not to move around too much. They already fussed at me. <laughs> but I come to the house of God to worship him. I'll come to the house of God to be with you, to worship with you. I come here to praise him and to magnify his name and, and to feel his presence in a manifest way. Why? Because it gives me strength to do that. It gives me strength to go on to the next day. But the next day comes. And usually you're not there. And I can't worship with you. Here's Elijah. There's a backstory to this story. Elijah's running for his life. So he thinks. Now this is a man, not too many verses before you read where he brought uh, King Ahab to a place, he said, we're going to figure out who God really is. We're going to have a contest, Brother Jonathan. And when we find out, when we go through this contest, this contest is going to prove who Almighty God really is. He said, I want you to get your prophets of Baal. And the Bible says, which they numbered about 450. And here, 450, and here's Elijah. And Elijah said, what I want you to do is y'all build an altar and y'all sacrifice an animal to your God. And I'm going to build an altar and I'm going to sacrifice to my God. And the God that answers by fire, we're going to worship. That's what he said. He spoke with power. This is a man who stopped the rain. This is a man who started the rain. He, it even says in the word, according to my word, it will not rain until I say different. And God said, okay. That's how powerful this man was. This is the man that went to the widow woman and, and, and his, her son was dying and he laid on her until she, he arose. 
This is the man who said, fix me a cake and, and something to drink. And she said, I have enough for one. He said, fix it for me. Seems really selfish, doesn't it? But do you know they say they ate for like weeks after that off of that that was only good for one because he knew I have a God that can supply all my needs. This is who we're talking about now. We're talking about a man that when the prophets of Baal decided that what they were going to do and they sacrificed and nothing was happening, they were just, they were running. They jumped on the altar. They cut themselves. They started bleeding on the altar. They did all this stuff. And, and, and Elijah, <laughs> Elijah looked at him and said, you got out of town? He on vacation? What's going on? Y'all can't find him? He mocked them. You see, because one thing is, and this is something we can rest assured on, one thing is he knew who his God was. He knew who his God was. He said, okay, this is enough of this mess. Let me show you something. And he called on the name of the Almighty God after he had dug a ditch and he put water in it. And three times he poured barrels of water on that and he filled up the ditch where it was sitting. And when he called on God, it wasn't any weight. He didn't have to worry about it. The Bible says it fell down from heaven and it licked up everything. His sacrifice, their sacrifice. Hey, it did everything. This is the man we're talking about. And right after this, Ahab goes and tells his wife everything that had happened. And he was so sad. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Somebody told me that. I say, oh, my, where's the altar? I need to pray. I need to repent. But not this woman. No, sir. You know what she did? She goes, well, I'll, I tell you what, I'll be dead in the morning or he will be. She made a vow. She was going after him and Elijah heard about it and that scared him. And the Bible says he ran away and this is where we find him. He's all alone. The angel has cooked him a cake I'm talking about this happened right before this. Cooked him a cake to give him sustenance to get there. But he didn't have a meeting with God until he heard the still small voice. I'm going to tell you, we come to church and we worship him. We come to church and praise him. But there are times, I'm going to tell you something, and, and, and it is the most wonderful times when I'm just all by myself. And I might be sitting, I might be laying, I might be kneeling, but wherever it is, it's just me and him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Elijah had one of those moments where it was just him and God. Those are the things that sustain you day after day after day. And the enemy knows it. Those times alone, those quiet times, those are the time God shows us everything as well. Brother G, there's an old story that I've heard for years, and it's a beautiful story about Brother G.T. Haywood. I don't know if you know who he is, but you will before I finish. He was an old African-American preacher, and he went alone in his study, and he prayed, and he prayed. And, and, and from what I understand, he prayed, and the people at church wondered where he was. It was time for church. Brother G.T. Haywood was still in his study, and he was still praying and praying. And it was time for the minister to come and preach on the platform. And the story goes that finally, Brother G.T. Haywood came out of his office. And all he could do was say, on Calvary's hill of sorrow, where sin's demands were paid, and rays of hope for tomorrow across our path were laid. 
I see a crimson stream of blood. It flows from Calvary. It's waves which reach the throne of God are sweeping over me. He wrote other songs, but he came out of there with an experience. Why? Because he had a manifest presence of God with him that swept that whole church. The enemy's going to do everything he can to make sure you don't get into God's presence. He will use every distraction he possibly can. We have all kinds of distractions that happen in this world today. The advertising world is a master of distraction. If you get on and read an article on the Internet, usually there are ads that are distractions on the side of those ads. They're meant to get your attention because they're trying to sell you a product. If you're going down the road and listening to the radio, they'll have commercials in between the songs, unless it's K-Love. But anyway, they'll have songs, uh, commercials there. Why? They want to, those commercials pay for time so they can pay their bills. Amen. They, the, there's billboards on the side of the road that try to get your distraction, and they want to get you to buy something. In fact, there's some p- towns that have completely banned billboards because they say they're too much of a distraction when you should be paying to, attention to the road. And that's true. The enemy fell from heaven like lightning, the Bible said. He lost that joy unspeakable full of glory. He knew what it was like. But he lost that. Can you imagine? I can't even imagine losing my, the presence of God. Can't imagine it. He knew an all-knowing and an all-loving God. He understands where he was and where he is. And he understands that he's going to lose because nothing is greater than my God. Hallelujah. I said nothing is greater than my God. But the bottom line, Jesus did not have to die on the cross for me. He chose to do that for me. I heard a song this past week that said, the cross in the middle should have been mine. I never heard that. Boy, it was a good song. Why? Because I was the one born into sin. He was a perfect lamb of God. Sin permeates my life unless it's through the blood of Jesus is the only way that I'm going to get rid of that. Hallelujah. He does not want you to be in the presence of God. He wants to destroy you. He wants you to go to hell, literally speaking. He does. He wants his way with you. So he understands that if you find the presence of God and dwell in his presence, then he has no hold on you. I'm going to tell you something. I want to be slippery when it comes to the devil. I don't want him having any hold of me. If he grabs me, I want it off of me. (laughs) But let me always maintain God's presence in me. Let him always maintain the Holy Ghost in me, and I won't have a problem because that will be a barrier from him. Satan is a liar. Amen. That's right. He sure is. That's why it's important for us to know, because if we have sin in our lives, if we open up a door, then he's liable to put his foot in the door. That's the last thing we want to happen is to let him have a foot in the door because what does that foot in the door represent? That represents I open the door to a temptation in my life. I don't want to open up a door to a temptation in my life. Amen. I want to overcome by the blood of the lamb. Hallelujah. It's the last thing we need to do. There's a man in the Bible we read and we've heard a lot of sermons preached on King Saul. 
He started out real good. He, 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 he talked to the man of God, wanted to know what he had to say. The Bible said he was head and shoulders above everybody, everybody in Israel. He was a good king until he wasn't. You see, Saul had a problem. He had an ego problem. It was, he had a me problem. Ooh, hello, help us all. If we let me get out of hand, then the enemy can come just take care of me. Amen. Think about it. Saul had everything going for him. And then Samuel 15 and 13 said, And Samuel came to Saul and said to him, Bless thou. And Saul looked at him and said, Bless thou be the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. He was proud of himself. Notice I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, what meaneth this? The bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the ox when I hear. You see, God had told him to destroy everything. The sheep, everything. Wipe it out. Wipe it out. Because they are, he said, because they're in sin and they're coming against the children, my children. So wipe them out. He said, what meaneth then the bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, they went from I to they. Have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen. You notice how the blame just got thrown off? To sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. We destroyed everything else. You don't tell me that he knew Samuel well enough that when he came back, he knew Samuel was going to talk to him. Because the first thing out of his mouth was, I have performed the commandments of the Lord. Then Samuel, verse 16, said unto Saul, Stay. And I will tell thee what the Lord has said this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast in thy little in thine own sight, thou wast not made head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou, he didn't blame the people, thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, I'm going to stop right there because the Lord spoke something to me and I really believe this. The difference between Saul and David the difference between Saul and David. This was Saul's opportunity to fall on his face and repent and say, I am so sorry. I messed up. I did it. It's my fault. And God, I want you to forgive me and not take this out on Israel. This is all me. I really believe with all my heart, God would have looked down and forgiven him. All he had to do was say, I'm sorry. And really mean it with all his heart. Why do you say that? Because there was another prophet named Nathan that looked at David when he had sinned. And David said, you tell me who he is. And he looked at him and said, thou art the man. And the Bible says, the first thing David hit, hit the ground. Put on sackcloth and that said, I, I, I'm guilty. And God turned the prophet around and said, thy sin is gone from me. Why? Because he repented. I'm going to tell you something. Don't let the enemy distract you and not repenting. 
Don't let your pride get in the way of not repenting. If you do something wrong, go to the Lord and say, God, I messed up. I'm sorry. I want you to forgive me because I got to make it. I got to see you one day. I got to see when you split the eastern sky, I want to be there. Don't get distracted. Even after this, and he told him this, Saul said, yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone, but the people, he blamed them. That's not what he was supposed to do. God opened the door for him to repent, and he will open the door for you to repent. That's why we come to church, and we can come to the altar, and we can say, God, I messed up this week. Hallelujah. But don't wait that long. Find your own altar. Maybe in your car. It may be in your closet. Say, God, I messed up today, and I want you to forgive me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Could we lift our hands and worship him? <sighs> <laughs> hallelujah, 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 amen. God opens a door for repentance, you repent, you repent. We find that depression permeated Saul's life so much, he couldn't feel in the presence of God anymore. And, 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 and he would get David, of all people, he would get David to come in and play the harp for him, and it would soothe his soul. He had Samuel he could go to. But when Samuel died, he was alone. He was alone. When God Opens the door to repent. Repent. I promise you, we live in a time of grace and a time of mercy, and he will forgive you. Hallelujah. And I'm going to tell you something else. You ever come to this altar and repent, not one person in this room will ever look down on you because we've been right where you're at. Hallelujah. And we want God to forgive you. Hallelujah. Could we all stand and thank God for that? Hallelujah. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. The enemy would like nothing more to fill up your life with things of this world. Hallelujah. And things of your flesh. But you're going to overcome. I don't know who you are, but you're going to overcome. Hallelujah, you're here tonight, and you're going to overcome. Listen to his word. Read his word. Listen to his voice. Yes, the enemy will just try to distract. He will. It's, it's not, and I know this is a broken record, it's not how many times a man falls. It's how many times he gets back up. Just keep getting back up. The Bible says for us to sit, to forgive our brother 790 times in one day, so how many more times will God forgive me? I'm not saying go around willing sin, but I'm saying bring it to Jesus. Get back up. Everybody say, get back up. Amen. Hallelujah. Get back up. Hallelujah. Could our musicians come, please? Distractions. He doesn't want you to get in his presence. He doesn't want to feel you to feel his presence. But there's nothing like his presence. Have you ever gone to a prayer meeting and then the Holy Ghost just broke out? Have you ever been in your car and the Holy Ghost broke out? Pull over. <laughs> Have you ever been in your room and the Holy Ghost just broke out? Just anywhere it can happen. But you got to stay 
Oh, Lord, hallelujah. I know one thing. I need to pray more. I need to read his word more. I, I need to stay tuned more. Because Brother, Brother Hardwick, you sent me something this week. It kind of shook me about the red heifer. I listened to that thing, and I said, oh, Lord. There's a red heifer in Israel, and they're building a temple to sacrifice this red heifer. It's the 10th red heifer to be sacrificed. And it said it's going to be ready to sacrifice in a year. And this is the one of the things that happens in the end times. I'm telling you, let them do it. <laughs> I'm serious. Let them do it. You see, I've repented of my sins. I've been baptized in the precious name of Jesus. <laughs> Me and Taylor, last night he came in my room and we had a discussion about the oneness of Jesus Christ. He said, I just want you to explain it to me. I'm not changing my mind. Don't worry about that. He said, I just want to talk about it. Oh, let's talk. <laughs> let's talk. And we talked about Jesus and how we baptize in Jesus' name. And we talked about First uh, Timothy 3, 16, wherefore the mystery of great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified of the spirit. I, we went through all these things. I went through them, John, 1-1, one, one, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And the Word then, in verse 14, was made flesh. And we went through all these things in the Word of God. We went through where in the Old Testament it says, Our Lord, our God, is one Lord. <laughs> went through all these things. We had a great discussion. He didn't want to quit. <laughs> and that was precious. I, makes a dad's heart proud. When your child wants to talk about Jesus. And I believe he wants to learn more so he can share more. I really do. Is he perfect? Absolutely not. Because I'm not. None of you are. We're flawed. First Timothy 4 and 10. For Demas, Demas has forsaken me. <laughs> I mean, love this present world. There is a lot out there to offer young people. There's a lot out there. And not one thing is worth your salvation. Not one thing. Take it from this old guy. <laughs> There's not one thing worth your salvation. Could we just bask in his presence? Because I feel it right now. Amen. Lord, I, I pray for a manifest presence of God. If you want to, come stand at the front. And let's just worship him right now. And let's praise him and bask in his presence. Hey, take a bath in his presence. It'll clean you better than any water that you've ever used. It'll cleanse you from every sin. Don't get distracted right now. Lift your hands and worship him. Give it all to him right now. No distraction, no other thoughts. Just praise him. That's it. Lock in.
Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you can download our app, or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.